and so when he comes down with his hands resting on the wings of two angels and he comes down in the masjid in Damascus and it's it is the time of the morning prayer Salat al Fajr and the Imam recognizes him this is the son of Mary Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, we are grateful to Allah that we were kindly allowed to to allow to deliver this lecture here at the Manchester Islamic Center and uh, we thank uh, our learned brother the learned scholar Sayyid Abai for his kind permission to lecture here at this center our topic uh, yesterday was the critical importance of Islamic eschatology at this time and you would realize that if our analysis was correct that there'd be very very few children tomorrow who become Hafiz of the Quran who are living in the cities who grew up in the cities and who are inundated by the electromagnetic waves with which we are now subjected and which I identified as Dabbatul Ar uh, that the Quran speaks of the creature of the earth which will remember, don't forget the Quran says about Dabbatul Ar that it will consume the staff of Solomon, Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. Don't forget that. And uh, the way we would try to protect our children in particular is to take them out of this damaging influence. The birds, sorry, the bees can no longer navigate because of it and honey production is falling now around the world. You are an intelligent people and you have the capacity to think. And all that I'm doing in Britain is inviting you to think. So if they want to close the doors of the masjid to me because I'm inviting you to think, there's a question mark behind them. Tonight, we look at a different subject the Messiah and the Imam. And there are some parts of this lecture I'm going to repeat again and again and again so that I don't have to face a question at the end by someone who still did not hear me. Yes, because I don't want to have to ask him, did you not hear me speak? and repeat it once, twice, three, four, five times? Were you in dreamland? A warning. <coughs> I'm going to repeat certain things so, several times in order to prevent you from asking a question at the end. It'll make you look foolish. <laughs> All right? The Messiah and the Imam. Who is the Messiah and why is he known as the Messiah and what is his role in history the Jew says that history will end with the advent of the Messiah who will rule the world from Jerusalem that is Judaism the Christian says that history will end 
with the, with the Messiah who will rule the world from Jerusalem, but who will return to do so. And the Muslim says exactly what the Christian says, that history will end with the Messiah who will rule the world from Jerusalem, but who will return to do so. So there is a conversion, convergence between Judaism and Christianity on, and Islam on the subject of the Messiah. Hence, it has to be a very important subject. It's not a subject of peripheral importance, but central importance. Where did the Jew get this belief about a Messiah who will come to rule the world from Jerusalem? If you were not here yesterday, I cannot repeat <laughs> what I did yesterday. So you have to try to go to my lectures, uh, go to my book entitled The Jal, the Quran and the Beginning of History, which is the back, and that will fill up the gaps from yesterday. Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, and he is he experiences a vision. He is the successor of David, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, who established the holy state of Israel. And we call it the Khilafah state. They call it the holy state. It's the same thing. And this holy state is a ruling state in the world. And David and Solomon, Allah's blessings be upon them, are ruling the world from Jerusalem. And they are leading the Israelite people. And so the Israelite people are ruling the world. And then suddenly, as soon as Solomon died, holy Israel collapsed. Suddenly, mysteriously, calamitously, and the hearts of the Israelite people were broken. Overnight, we were ruling the world and now everything is gone. What caused holy Israel to collapse and for them to suffer this great broken heartedness? The answer is located in the Quran, in Surah Al-Sal, that Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, saw a vision, and in that vision he saw a jasad sitting on his throne, and I spent some time yesterday with the jasad. So if you don't know, don't ask me. Go read the book. We have a limited amount of time tonight, one hour for lecture and half an hour for question and answer. There is a jasad sitting on his throne. He recognizes the jasad to be an evil person. And he recognizes that he wants to inherit my kingdom. And he doesn't want that. So he prayed. He made a prayer to the Lord God that no one should be able to inherit my kingdom after I die. And then Allah answered his dua. And that is why holy Israel collapsed. And we said that the Jasad was Dajjal, the false messiah. Mm -hmm. When holy Israel collapsed, and the believers who worshipped the one God were broken hearted, it was in that context that Allah Most High then made a promise to them. That he would send one to them who will bring back holy Israel, bring back the Khilafah state, bring back an Israel which will rule the world. And so the golden age will come back one more time. And that person will be known as the Messiah. Good. And the Quran declares, 
that the Messiah was sent to the Israelite people. Let me repeat it for the second time. Yabani Israel, O people of Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum, I am the messenger sent by the Lord God to you. Let me repeat it for the third time. That the Quran says that the Messiah was sent to the Israelite people. And let me repeat it for the last time. So we don't have anyone making a fool of himself at the end of the lecture. Four times, eh? The Quran says that the Messiah was sent to the Israelite people. Not once, it's said it several times in the Quran. Good. Can uh, the word of God change? Yes, it can. The, co the word of God tells us that he can change his word, he says, uh, this is critically important for methodology. We do not cause any ayah, any verse, any sign which has come from us to be cancelled or abrogated or forgotten, but that we replace it with that which is better or similar. This is the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah. And so, yes, there are changes. Shall we give you examples? The truth at the level of substance is one and the same. A same truth which came with Abraham. Allah's blessings be upon him. In substance is the same truth which came with Moses. Allah's blessings be upon him. In substance is the same truth which came with Jesus. Allah's blessings be upon him. In substance is the same truth which came with Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon him. In the Quran it is called Islam. So if you say that Islam came to the world for the first time with Muhammad, Allah's blessing will be upon him, you're still a schoolboy. <laughs> you're still a schoolboy. You need to go back to school. But that truth, which at the level of substance is one and the same, at the level of form it differs. The kullin ja'alna minkum shira'atan wa minhaja. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَهْ جَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Allah could have caused us, if He wanted to do so, to be one religious community, one religious community. But no, that was not His plan. So He creates several religious communities within the same one truth. And he gives to each religious community a sacred law. And that sacred law gives us, for example, a direction to which we must turn in prayer. And so the direction, the direction for prayer when Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings, began to preach was Jerusalem. And we who followed him we prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. That's how we prayed as Muslims. Until Allah, in his wisdom, decided that this must now be a separate religious community, or to use the Arabic term, Ummah. And so he changed the direction of prayer for us. For us, not for them, for us, the new direction of prayer is Makkah. Uh, could you kindly call Saudi Arabia on the phone for me and tell them the direction of prayer is Makkah, not Washington? <laughs> the, the, the new direction of prayer for us is Makkah, the Kaaba built by Abraham. But for them, the direction of prayer continues to be Jerusalem. 
when we arrived in uh, Medina in Yatrim, we fasted with the Jews. Oh yes, on the days when they fasted. And in accordance with the law of fasting in the Torah, which was, you must remind them, the law is from sunset to sunset. No food, no drink, no sexual relations on dispersed days of the year. And uh, when Allah changed the law, he gave us a new law. And the new law, of course, we consider it to be better. Yes, because now Allah says, and when this verse was revealed, all of Medina was smiling. It's now halal for you. You can go to your wives on the nights of fasting. So now the new law of fasting is from dawn until sunset for one consolidated month of the year. Here, this is naskh, abrogation. So who changes the law? Is it Tom, Dick and Harry? Or is it the Maulana, the Sheikh or the Mufti? Who has the authority to change the law? When you hear me raise my voice, it's time to be careful. Who has the authority to change the law? Be careful with your answer. Only Allah. And he acts through his messengers. The messenger of Allah does not have authority unless Allah gives him the authority to do so. So if Allah says that the Messiah is sent to the Israelite people, you do not have the authority to change that. Only Allah has the authority to change that. It is because the, uh, the Messiah is going to come back. He came and he left. He was the son of the Virgin Mary. He was Jesus, Nabi Isa. He was the Messiah, says the Quran. And uh, he came. And some of the Israelite people accepted him and some rejected him. Those who rejected him, they celebrated when they saw him crucified on the cross before their very eyes. And those who accepted him, they wept on that day. Of course, it wait, we had to wait 600 years for the Quran to be revealed so that we would know what exactly happened on that day. But that's not our subject today. Those who celebrated, the Quran no longer refers to them as Israelite people. The Quran now refers to them as Yahud, the Jews. Those who wept, the Quran no longer rec refers to them as Israelite people. The Quran now refers to them as a Nasara, the Christians. And these two communities of Israelite people, those who rejected the Messiah and those who accepted the Messiah, the Quran now uses a new term for them, Ahlul Kitab. Good. Our Prophet said, he confirmed, that that man who was sitting on the throne, that evil man who was sitting on the throne that Solomon saw in his vision, who wants to inherit the kingdom of holy Israel, he wants to do so because he wants to rule the world from Jerusalem. And he is, we said, the Jal, the false messiah, the antichrist. Why would he want to rule the world from Jerusalem? Because the promise was that the Messiah would do so. He would bring back the golden age. And our prophet said yes. That when Jesus returns, he will return to rule. He would be hakim. 
and he will rule with justice, Hakimul Adil. So my question is, when he comes to rule the world from Jerusalem, who will be those who will rule with him? Will it be the, uh, the whole world who will follow him? Is Allah going to change the law and now send him back to the whole world? Or is he going to come back to the Israelite people? When we search for evidence, we find no evidence of any change in the law. None. And it's a little bit late now for any evil person to search to manufacture new evidence. So we conclude that when he returns, he will rule the world from Jerusalem and it will be those to whom he is sent who follow him, who will rule the world with him. Is he sent to us? We who follow another prophet? Is he sent to the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? The answer is no. There is no evidence in the Quran of Naskh. And so, I don't want to have to repeat it 5,000 times. When Jesus returns to the world, he is not coming back to rule the world, including the Ummah of Muhammad He would not be our Amir. No. <coughs> Why is he called Al-Masih? Masa means to touch. And the Quran explains why he's given the term Messiah. Why? وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ That he is constantly touched by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the rest of the world uses the Holy Spirit, but Britain is different from the rest of the world. Oh yes, Britain is always different. So Britain has another term they call ghost. Terrible, fearful term, a ghost. You don't want to see a ghost in the middle of the night, do you? So they call it the Holy Ghost. But the rest of the world know it as the Holy Spirit. The Ruhul Qudus. And in the Quran, the Holy Spirit is recognized as the angel Gabriel. So he's touched by the Holy Spirit. As a consequence of being touched by the Holy Spirit, he can do things that no human being can do. For example, he can take mud and shape it in the form of birds, and he can breathe into the birds, and by Allah's leave, they become living birds and fly away. And when he comes back, you will see him doing that. Yes, he can cause the dead to come back to life by Allah's leave. He can cure you of leprosy, he can make the blind see. All of these things that human beings can't do. And he's able to do this because he's touched by the Holy Spirit. So what about the community of people who follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam. If he is coming back to rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal because the Quran says when they were about to crucify him this is in Surah to Ali Imran that Allah spoke to him the Lord God. They call him God the Father. Ya Isa, O oh Jesus, he's speaking to him. Inni mutawafiq, I'm going to take your soul. He didn't know. Now he's being told. 
What I feel, okay, Ilay, and I'm going to raise you unto myself. So he is still up to this day with Allah. And I'm going to cleanse you and purify you of all the nasty things they said about you and about your mother. Now listen. And I'm going to cause those who follow you. Do we follow him? Do we follow him or do we follow Muhammad? Allah's blessing be upon Why is my audience so scared tonight? Did I scare you? <laughs> no, we do not follow Jesus. We follow Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon them both. So we are not a people referred to when Allah says, وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ and I'm going to cause those who follow you, O oh Jesus. I'm going to raise them. I'm going to cause you and those who follow you to be raised to a position of dominance and superiority over this other group. This other group. And you know who they are. Yes, you know who they are. They are the ones who have power in the world today. <laughs> so this group will become more powerful than this group. And when those who follow Jesus are raised to that position of dominance, and this is about to occur. This is about to occur for those who think and that's all I'm doing in Britain, asking you to think. That's all. <laughs> think, study the Quran. When Allah, this, this is already beginning now, we can see the signs. That those who truly follow Jesus, uh, and they are people who don't go fishing on the day of the Sabbath. Okay, go check it out in the Quran. When those who follow Jesus, are now raised to that position of dominance in the world. They will remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world. So does the Quran say that the followers of Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, are going to rule the world? Where did you get that nonsense from? From which garbage bin did you take it out? I have to control myself. I don't sh shout and scream and hit the table. Where did you get this from? That the followers of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam are going to rule the world. When the Quran is saying something else, I have some advice for you. Proper scholarship, the hallmark of a scholar, is that when the Quran speaks to you and you understand what you did not understand before and you recognize that you made a mistake, if you are a scholar, if you have respect for truth, if you have integrity in you, you will immediately accept that you made a mistake and correct yourself. Yes, and I have, the Quran has corrected me so many times and I have to come to you and say to you people, I made a mistake, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. When will you do that? I'm setting the example for you. This is scholarship. Absolute truth is in the word of God. And the human mind must submit. You cannot say, no, 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 no. If I do that, I'm going to be unfaithful to this 
sectarian agenda that I have and that sectarian agenda and that sectarian agenda and that sectarian agenda. And I cannot betray my sectarian group. No. <laughs> Those are the ones who are closing the doors of the masjid to me. No, if you are a scholar, be faithful to the Quran. Let the Quran teach you. Let the Quran take you to the truth. So the Quran does not tell us that the followers of Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, are going to rule the world in the end time. The Quran tells us very clearly that it is the followers of Jesus who will be raised by Allah. And they will rule the world in the end time. Of course, the relationship between the two, the followers of Jesus and the followers of Muhammad, the relationship between the two should be like the relationship between these two men. What is the relationship between Jesus and Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him? I did dwell on this yesterday, I think, uh, that in the Quran, uh, shall I repeat it? For those who are not here? Yes. That in the Quran, Allah refers to our Prophet by the name Muhammad four times. You can go check it out. Bismillah. But in the Quran, when Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam, refers to our Prophet by name, by name, Ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum, Musaddikan lima bayna yadayya min al-Tawrat, wa mubashiran bi rasuli ya'ti min da'ad ismuhu, ismuhu, Ahmad that I have come to give you the glad tidings of a messenger who will come from the Lord God after me. And his name would be Ahmad. This is an invitation for you to think. But you will not think correctly. Allah will not give you the right with which to think unless you are faithful to this book. Whether what the book gives you, you are comfortable with it or you are not, your head must bow before this book. You must accept what is in the book even if it contradicts all that you have believed before. Once it is in the book, submit to it. That is scholarship. And this book will raise you. Raise you so high. But if you betray the book, the book will send you down. This book will do it. That's what our prophet said about the Quran. So why does he say his name is Ahmad when Allah says his name is Muhammad? And the Quran tells us that although the Quran was revealed 600 years later, Allah says in the Quran, وَيُعَلِّمُهُ kitab that Allah will teach him in the Quran. Wal hikmah. And Allah will bestow on him wisdom. Wal Torah. And Allah will teach him the Torah. Wal Injil. And Allah will teach him the Gospel. Now take a little time. Take a little time. Don't be too fast. Hurry. On this side is the Quran. 
and on this side is the Torah and the Gospel. And in between is wisdom. What does it imply? Hmm? What it implies is that when he returns, as he will return, all that we need is number one, the Great War. And they are lusting for the Great War now. I mentioned that yesterday. They are actually lusting for the Great War. And the Great War is coming. And we have a lot of information about that Great War. What do we do with it? I'll tell you. We eat biryani and we go home and sleep. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> I have a little booklet at the back. The Quran, the Great War and the West. Just read it. So there will be the Great War. And then after that, very soon after that, there will be the conquest of Constantinople. Hmm? I have just written a book on Constantinople in the Quran. It's now being printed. But this weekend, it will be on my website. So you can download it free of charge. Small book. And after the conquest of Constantinople, would be the Khuruj of Dajjal, the Antichrist, will appear in person. And after that, of course, the true Messiah will return. And he will kill the Antichrist. And he will then rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. And the period of time which will elapse between the Great War and the emergence of Dajjal in human form one hadith says seven months and the other one says how much? Huh? Seven, years. seven years, correct, you see, we have someone thinking here. And uh, Abu Dawood argues, the, the Sunan of Abu Dawood, he says that this one is a sound of you, seven years. Hmm? But whether it be seven months or seven years, a brief period of time. And the great war is around the corner. While we're eating our biryani, it's around the corner. So we don't have much time left. No? Before the, the, the Jal appears and then the Messiah will return. When the Messiah returns, what is the mission of this Ummah? We will not be ruling the world in the end time. Shall I repeat that a hundred thousand times for you? Will you learn to submit to the Quran? The Quran says that Allah is going to raise those who follow Jesus. These are the ones who are going to rule the world in the end time. And we are now asking the question, what is the relationship now between the two communities? The one who follows Jesus and the one who follows Muhammad. Not all Christians follow Jesus, you know. Quite a number of them follow Santa Claus. <laughs> and not all Muslims follow Muhammad. No, some of them, they, they chop up your body into bits and pieces and use a bone saw to, hmm? and then they try to cover it with a mountain of lies. So not all Muslims follow Muhammad What is the mission of this Ummah in the end time? We have an important mission. Because we are the ones who will conquer Constantinople. So the Great War is not going to destroy the whole world. No. There will be left in the world after the Great War. At least this army that our Prophet praised. And the commander was praised. 
and this will take place after the Great War. Our brothers in Turkey, they are our brothers, and in the Balkans, they need to think again that the conquest of Constantinople by the Sultan Muhammad Fatih in the year 1453 does not qualify, does not qualify as the prof prophesied conquest of Constantinople by Prophet Muhammad No. The conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Great War, number one, and the Great War has not taken place as yet. And number two, that once the conquest, once the Great War takes place, then the conquest of Constantinople and the emergence of the Antichrist in person will take place within seven years. Since 1453 uh, to this day, I think more than seven years have passed. Uh, is it possible for our brothers in Turkey to go back and think and study again? So this Ummah has an important mission. He praised the, the army and he praised the, the commander. But he never identified the name of the commander. And I don't need your help if you don't mind. I don't need your help. I don't need your help. He never identified the name of the commander. So if you know the name, keep your secret to yourself. I don't want it. And he praised the army. Why did he do that? Answer. Because they keep on praising that army. And they keep on praising that commander to the heavens high, Sultan Muhammad Fatih. Because they are praising that army and that commander. He praises this army and this commander. Because this army and this commander will correct the wrong done by that army and that commander. Among the things that he did was to... Con was to defy the command of Allah in the Quran that the believers must protect the houses of Allah and the Quran mentions masajid and it mentions churches and it mentions temples and it mentions synagogues and you have to protect them Surah Al-Hajj and instead of protecting Hagia Sophia, the greatest cathedral of the, earth, of the Christian world, when he conquered Constantinople, he shamefully and disgracefully and manifestly sinfully converted the Christian cathedral to a masjid, to the eternal shame and disgrace of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those who differ with me, keep your arguments to yourself. I don't need to hear it. The Quran is my guide. Take your legal arguments and go with them. I don't need it. The law must conform with the Qur'an. And the Qur'an orders you to protect those churches and synagogues and masajid. And therefore he violated Allah's command in the Qur'an. So when this army conquers Constantinople, the first thing that the commander will do will be to return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christians. This is your cathedral. But I don't know when my people will learn to think. I don't know why they are so fond of eating biryani and going home to sleep. My language is a little bit harsh. You have to excuse me. But when I see my people sleeping, I'm, I'm fired up with it. How can I wake you up? When will, I, will you be faithful to the Quran? This Ummah has other work to do. Our Prophet said, 
And once upon a time when I was based in the United States, I could go to the, to the State University of New York in Stony Brook and I can give a lecture, packed audience, and the Jews are sitting right in front of me and I can quote the prophet. You will most certainly fight the Jews. And you will most certainly defeat them. Until the stones and the rocks will speak. Ya Muslim. There's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Of course. I then have to qualify my remarks that the Quran is not telling you to go and kill all the Jews. The Quran is not telling you to kill all the Jews. If you believe that, you are schoolboy. <laughs> schoolboy. No, it is the Jews who are oppressors. Those are the ones that you would kill. And so it is also the mission of this Ummah to liberate Jerusalem. We have important work to do in the end time. But we have something else to do in the end time. This Ummah. Our Prophet spoke about one who will be known as the Imam, Imam al Mahdi. And we love him. We love him. Because he has a special mission. The first thing he has to do is something which brings joy to our hearts. A Khalifa would die and uh, his book Tahrir argues that this means that the Khilafah state will be restored before this Imam comes. And I say, no, this is any ruler who is being referred to as a Khalifa. And when this Khalifa dies, when this ruler dies, there will be disagreement concerning succession. Twenty years ago, I said it's going to be a Saudi king who will die. Twenty years later, the evidence is plain as daylight that I'm correct. A Saudi king will die. And when he dies, there's going to be a boxing match. Oh, yes. There's going to be disagreement and conflict and sun concerning succession. And now you have some more fire in the oil with, you know, the bone saw and the body chopped up into bits and pieces and the whole world, including the CIA, which normally does not speak the truth, but this time the CIA spoke the truth. The CIA said, he is the one <laughs> who ordered it. Yeah, he's the one who ordered it. So if he succeeds his father, I hope he succeeds his father, yes. If he succeeds his father, Oh la la, he's going to become the laughing stock of the world. Anywhere he puts his foot on the face of the earth, people are going to be agitating and demonstrating against him and placards and this and that and that. He's going to have to find a hole in which to hide himself. And so Saudi Arabia will become the laughing stock of the world. And already the royal family is beginning to realize that. But they are stuck. They are stuck. Because the reins of power are in his hands. The military, the police, everything in his hands. And so you can see that when Salman dies, if this little schoolboy replaces him, I hope he does, I don't know then you're going to have a period of instability in Saudi Arabia. I don't know how long it will last. 
maybe it will continue after the Great War. It is at that time when there is this disagreement. Our prophet said that a man will come out of Medina, Yatrib, now known as Medina, and hurry to Makkah. And this is the Imam. And the people would take the bay'ah with him at the Kaaba. The Prophet then went on to say, and I have a few minutes left, that he will be attacked by an army from the Quraysh. So the schoolboy will attack him. <laughs> and that army will be an army of the Kalb. Oh, but Kalb can has two meanings. Kalb can be the tribe of the Kalb. And Kalb can also mean a dog. But there is no evidence at this time of the tribe of the Kalb still existing in Arabia, under Quraysh. No, ex no ex evidence at all of a Kalb tribe. So my conclusion, uh, one with which I am very happy, is that Kalb has the other meaning. So that army <laughs> will attack the Imam and he will defeat that army. And on that day when that army is defeated, we will smile, we will celebrate. Oh yes, because the Arabian Peninsula, Jazeera to the Arab, will be liberated. And then if the Hajj takes place after that, and I am alive, I will go perform that Hajj. Say, Rabbi, Rabbi, I will go perform that Hajj. But this time, I put my money in dinar, and I put it aside. Yeah. Because I am not going to perform this Hajj while these traitors are controlling the Hajj. No. Those who want to do otherwise, that's your choice. But when Arabia is liberated from these traitors, when the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I choose my words with great care, when the kingdom of Saudi Arabia returns to the garbage bin of Dajjal from where it emerged in the first place, it will be time for us to celebrate. So this Ummah has important work to do in the end time. And that Ummah has to rule the world. What is the relationship between the two? A very important part of the lecture with which we now conclude. It is because when Jesus returns, he will have his duties with us, not to lead us. No, he's not leading us. We have the Imam as our Amir. But he is a prophet of Allah, and Allah has given him the wisdom. So he has to manage between two ummas. And that is why you have the word hikmah in between. And Allah taught him the Quran. Wal hikmah, and Allah gave him wisdom. What Torah, wal Injil, and Allah taught him the Torah and the Injil. Spend a little time with the Quran. Don't be hurry with the Quran. So Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus, has to know both this Sharia and this Sharia. And so when he comes down. With his hands resting on the wings of two angels. And he comes down in the masjid in Damascus. And it's, it is the time of the morning prayer, Salatul Fajr. And the Imam recognizes him. This is the son of Mary. And then the Imam does the right thing. Oh yes, the Imam does the right thing. He invites Nabi Isa 
to lead the Salat. Yes, he does the right thing. Invites him, because this is the Imam. He invites him to lead the Salat. But he declines. He says, no, the people have appointed you as their Amir, you lead the Salat. And if you have not put on your thinking cap as yet, do please put it on now. Kindly so put it on now. Ask yourself, why does he decline to lead the Salat? And he invites the Imam, you lead the Salat. Don't go fishing for an answer in your own thinking. No, proper methodology is that truth is located in this book. When, when, when will you learn to become true scholars? When? And show respect for this book rather than your, the people who are closing the doors of the masjid to me, this sect and that sect and that sect and that sect. And then say, Avai says, come to me, I'll open the door for you. <laughs> You're sitting. Hmm? Uh, many people around the world are going to be listening to this lecture on the internet. Our brother, Sayyid Abai, is a Shia brother, and I am a Sunni. And look at how we live as brothers. Yeah. Why does the Prophet Jesus decline to lead the prayer? Okay. When I give my opinion, you know the law. Do not accept my opinion unless you are convinced that it is correct. This is my respect for your intellect. And also, I make mistakes. I make mistakes. When I give an interpretation of the Quran or the Hadith, only Allah can confirm that it is correct. Only Allah. But I would not give you that interpretation unless I was comfortable that it is correct. Otherwise, I should shut my mouth. If Jesus, Nabi Isa, alayhi salam, were to accept the invitation to lead the Salat, he would violate Allah's law. He would violate Allah's guidance because Allah did not send him to us. Allah sent him to another people. And if he were to lead the Salat and our leader were to pray behind him, our leader is the Imam, Imam al -Makli. He is our leader. And our leader prays behind him, the implication would be that Jesus will automatically become the leader of this Ummah. And that will be a violation of the Quran. And that's why, because Allah taught him the Quran and taught him the Torah and the Injil, this is the reason why he declines to lead the prayer. Now then, if you have other views of the subject, fine. But you cannot deny me the right to explain my interpretation. And so, the Imam leads the prayer. Excuse me, this is not indicative that the Imam now has a superior status to Jesus. No. He reads the prayer because Nabi Isa alayhi salam has asked him to lead the prayer. How will Jesus pray? He prays in accordance with our Sharia. 
and in the direction of our Qibla, our direction of prayer, Makkah. But when he is with his Ummah, leading his community of Christians and those Jews who choose to accept him before he arrives. Once he, once he comes, that's it. Too late now. <laughs> he will pray in the direction of that Qibla, Jerusalem. And the Quran confirms that that Qibla is still their Qibla. It's there in the Quran. That Qibla has not been cancelled or abrogated. Go do your homework. So that Qibla is still valid for them and this Qibla is valid for us and Allah commands us in the Quran, do not follow each other's Qibla. You follow your Qibla, they follow their Qibla or direction of prayer. That's in the Quran. So he will pray in the direction of Jerusalem and his prayer will be in accordance with the Sharia of the Torah because that is not abrogated. And so we will have two ummas. And how should they relate to each other? One led by Imam al-Mahdi and the other led by Nabi Isa -Islam. So why did he call him Ahmad? When Allah calls him Muhammad, Ismuhu Ahmad, will you think Allah sent the Quran to a people who think لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And we have some graduates of the Darulum sitting with us here tonight. And those graduates of the Darulum will tell you, Sheikh, we don't think anymore in the Darulum. Yeah. <laughs> we don't think anymore in the Darulum. Yeah. The reason why he refers to him by the name Ahmad, Ismu Ahmad, instead of Muhammad is because of the intense love between the two men. When you have love for someone, you choose a pet name for them, a love name. A number, Damur, a name of love. So your child, and you give your child a pet name, and you won't call your child by the name you give it your wife and you have a pet name for her. Hmm? And so, I see, a number, I see a number of you who are married who are smiling now. And, and so, he calls him Ahmad. And when he returns and you listen to him, he will always say Ahmad. This is love between the two men. If this is the love that exists between Nabi Isa alayhi salam and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, what should be the relationship between those who follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? I'm not talking about those who chop up the body and then, and then dump it or burn it with acid and so on and then cover it with a mountain of lies. I'm talking about those who follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And those who follow Jesus, obviously, the relationship between us has to be one of love and affection and mutual support. And so the Imam al-Mahdi will be a supporter, supporting and assisting he who will rule the world in Akhiru Zaman. I have not exhausted the subject, no, I know. But I was given a limitation of time and I've exceeded it by five minutes already. So now we will uh, pause now and we'll have a question and answer session that will be for half an hour. At the end of half an hour, if you insist that you want it to continue more than that, no blame on me. 
we can go on for the rest of the night. <laughs> but if you insist that you want to continue it, so just let me take a little drink of water and then we will continue, inshallah. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. Okay, we have now. It's now five minutes past eight. We have half an hour devoted to questions and answers and uh, any comments you want to make. Uh, someone asked me three questions in one yesterday. Remember? Make it one question. You have one question or three? One. one. Okay, go ahead. Just a quick one, just to clarify. Um, you know when uh, Nabi Isa comes back and he's being given knowledge of the Injil and the Torah, um, will it be the original one then? Obviously. It be it, I, I don't think Allah will teach him the, the corrupted Torah. Yeah. The corrupted Torah says that uh, a Jew is prohibited from lending money on interest to his brother, Israelite. But he's allowed to lend money on interest to the enemy. So I met in Plusgarden at a monastery in Scotland with the abbot, or the head of the monastery, and with his deputy. And we chatted for two hours. So I asked him, I said, Father, Am I your enemy? He was shocked. He said, no, 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 you are not my enemy. Because the Pope has declared that we have friendly relations. I said, Father, you're not allowed, a Christian is not allowed to lend money on, mis on interest to a Muslim. He said, yes, you're right. <laughs> so this is the Torah which has been corrupted to say that you could lend money on interest. And there are other corruptions in the Torah. But when Jesus is taught the Torah by Allah, he's taught the original book, not these corrections. I should send some reports. Not these corruptions, yeah. Okay, next question. Yeah. You asking one question or three? One question, good. I see more of like information, um, he said towards the end of the times, in the, in the Quran says that the closest people to Muslims will be the Christians. Who said a, that? Um, you know, the, towards the end of the times. Who said that in the end time, those who will be closest in love and affection to Muslims, to Muslims will be a Christian people? Who said that? Huh? In the previous text, says that. No, you must answer me. Who said it? I didn't say it. No, the Quran, that's right. It's, Allah said it in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ma'idah. I want you to become a scholar. Go ahead. So is this the time to refer to when Nabi Sallallahu comes? After the time that he closed? Or? The process has already commenced. A part of the Christian world is already drawing closer to us. But they have a lot of pain in their hearts. A few nights ago, I had dinner in, uh, what's the name of that place, Bilal? Huddersfield? Huddersfield, yeah. Uh, with the Orthodox Christians, and they were all highly qualified professionals and so on. Uh, several of them were women, and they all pushed out their hands to shake hands with me. And I said to them, uh, uh, oh, we're not allowed to shake hands with you, but we can offer you a nice smile. Because this came from Dajjal, men and women shaking hands. And uh, I spent three hours or more with them. And I was sharing with them my views of that in my book, Constantinople in the Quran. But even three, three and a half hours. Yes, they were respectful to me. No one was disrespectful to me. But there was a wall I could not break. 
So there's still a lot of pain. They are all Orthodox Greek Christians, all Greek. There's still a lot of pain. And I believe that we should reach out to them to help, to, to ex explain to them. If I were a Hindu, I would hate Islam. Oh, yes. If I were a Hindu, I would hate Islam. Why? I never invited you to come and rule over me. You came with a sword. You came with a bogus jihad to, rule, to conquer India and rule over India for so many centuries. So if the Hindus respond with hatred today, it's understandable. Similarly with the Orthodox Christians. They didn't invite the Ottoman Empire to come and rule over them. No. The Ottoman Empire came with a naked sword and waged a bogus jihad over them for so many years, centuries. And if you differ with me, wait for Judgment Day. So there's a lot of pain in their hearts. But Allah has said it, that a part of the Christian world is going to become closest in love and affection for you. Yes. And that is not dependent on us. That is going to take place. Which part of the Christian world will be coming close to us? Would, be, would it be the one where a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate? Obviously not. It will be that other part of the Christian world which is resisting this part. That part of the Christian world is already showing the signs of drawing closer to us. Go ahead. Mm. Any more questions? Mm. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for coming to my just track. I mean, uh, this is my first lecture that I mean, my friend and I performed yesterday. That you're coming here, so we came all the way from Birmingham. From where? Birmingham. Oh, but I'm going to be in Birmingham on Sunday. We, work, we, we live in, I live in Washington, we work in Birmingham. So okay. We finish early, so okay. Later, and then you here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. So How many hours? Uh, it took us two hours. Two hours, we okay. We're traffic today, so. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you said the Messiah was sent to uh, when Israel. I said it four times. Four times. Yeah, and, go ahead. And he will all be sent again to them. Yes, because there is no evidence of nask. Nask. Nask means change and abrogation. So my question is, is there, there's a fine line. So how would we identify who the real Christians are? Because the Christians believe that uh, Jesus Christ is you know, announced as the God Son of God, which violates all the law of monotheism and Abrahamic faiths. So, yes. and when he would descend, there would be an army of Muslims following uh, Imam Mahdi, and that's where he would descend to my knowledge. Yeah. And then where would his army be? Okay. And yeah. How would we identify those Christians? Yeah. Because they are not, because they're not, they are believing that he will, he is a God Son of God. All right. So now, I, I didn't say it. Nabi Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, he said. He said that when Jesus returns, he returns as Hakim al Adil, one who will rule and not rule downtown Chicago. No? He will come back to rule, meaning the ruling state in the world, and he'll rule with justice. This is our prophet. And the Quran has declared that he was sent to the Israelite people, and they were divided into two, the Jews and the Nasara. And the Quran says about this part, the people who follow him, not the people who reject him, that Allah is going to raise them to a position of dominance in the world. So by the time Jesus returns, they will already be in a position of dominance in the world. So you don't need a binoculars, you don't need a magnifying glass, to recognize who are in the dominant position in the world, okay? You can already see the signs as we, who is the dominant military power in the world today? If you don't know, go and do your homework. 
nature has a surprise coming when the war takes place. Now, coming to the other part of the question. Yes, the jar was at work. I can say this to you. If I say this to them, they might feel hurt. The jar was at work and he corrupted the teachings and he got them to worship Jesus and he got them to declare that Jesus is the Son of God and that God is the Father and he also got them to believe that the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped. Good? Um, and I have a limited amount of time to answer you so I have to cut and paste. You don't, don't mind. Now when the Quran was revealed, all of these changes had already taken place. The Christians had conquered Constantinople without any fighting. The first side of the wall fell, the second, the third. Okay? And these Christians who were in Constantinople have an important place in the Quran. Because the whole surah of the Quran is called Surah to Rum. So they're called Rum. And these Christians who are already worshipping Jesus as the Son of God and as the third person in the Trinity, they were defeated by the Persian Empire. The pagan Arabs identified with pagan Persia and they were taunting us because we were identified as with the Christian. We both have a religion similar to each other. Then Allah responded in the Quran and he said, Rome, Rome has been defeated. In a land close by, not Washington, land close by. But the tables will turn and they will soon be victorious. In fact, the, his, the historical record is that Constantinople was in a perilous position. They were facing, facing total defeat. The Persian Empire was ascendant. And it is in that context that this extraordinary prophecy came. That within a few years, Rome will be victorious. And then the Quran said something. And you've got to put on your thinking caps now. It says, Lillahi al-Amr, victory, and who determines victory is in Allah's hands. He decides, not you. But then comes very strange language. And uh, Allah invites you to think. He says, Lillahi al-Amr, Min qablu wa min ba'd. Min qablu wa min ba'd. Allah has the authority to determine victory both before and after. Both before and after. Both before and after. Many commentators of the Quran came to the conclusion that there will be two victories. The first one, which did take place within a few years, and Rome was victorious. But they said that the second victory was the Battle of Badr. That was wrong. No. Both victories are the victories of Rome. Both. But why? Min Kobdu wa Min Ba'd. Before and after. Before and after makes sense only if it is before something and after something. So there must be something in between. The first victory. And the second victory, what is there in between? Hmm? And I came to the conclusion that Rome will be victorious twice. The first one already occurred and the second one to come. 
And in between there is something which separates the people. And that was the great schism of 1054. Dajjal had done his work and one part of the Christian world broke away from Constantinople and came to the West and Allah cursed them. I did this yesterday, did I? Kunu kiradatan khasin, and I covered this yesterday for you. The other part remained faithful. Hmm? And that part will be victorious a second time. Now, and the Quran continues to say, وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And on that day when Rome is victorious, we, we, the believers, will celebrate. So there are two questions. Why would Allah ordain victory? To a Christian people who are already worshipping Jesus as the Son of God and is the God the Father and Son. Secondly, why would we, including Nabi Muhammad why would we celebrate why would we be happy and why would we celebrate as we did when Rome was victorious within a few years? And why would we again celebrate in the second victory of Rome which is to come? Answer, Allah has ordained that he still holds these people in high regard and he still grants them victory despite these beliefs. But the beliefs of these people are different from the beliefs of that side. But I don't have the time to explain that to you. Next question. Sheikh Sims. No, give, give. The older one first. <laughs> We have uh, 10 minutes left. Yeah, yeah um, recently you mentioned uh, about um, Imam Mahdi and going a little bit uh, <coughs> from off the topic. Um, you know, in our hadith, uh, it's already mentioned. I mean, it's good that you're explaining about Quran and Muslims are far away from Quran. And <coughs> topic and my topic is the Messiah and the Imam and uh, it is very plain and clear no one disputes it at all no Muslim disputes it that the Imam who is going to come who will rule over this Ummah 
is coming from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, no Muslim, Shia or Sunni differ with this. So a member of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam is going to rule over this Ummah in the end time full stop. We need not go any further on that. Yes. Yes. Uh, coming to uh, present time, uh, the uh, dimension that um, the true Christians uh, or true followers of Jesus Christ and Muslim or true Muslims are coming closer with each other. Don't you think that what's happened in Syria, uh, this has initiated it? Like people like Hezbollah, they have played on their life and they went and protected for churches and Christians. Uh, otherwise, the, that army, Jesh al Islam, you know, they are, that they were going to commit uh, genocide against Christians. I think it would be a fair comment to say that there are three different parties at work in protecting Syria and we should not single out one to give it the preeminent position. I don't think that is wise. If Russia had not intervened, Syria would have been lost already. Okay? Russia displayed incredible courage to take on the United States and NATO, which is the most powerful military force in the world. And the entire Russian people are in danger for Syria. If, he, if Putin had not done what he did, Lib Syria would have become another Libya, and those schoolboys would have been celebrating. But thank Allah that he intervened when he did, and Syria had been saved. But you also have in the Syrian armed forces Sunni and Shia fighting as brothers, side by side. I think it's going to be counterproductive. Yes, if we were to single out a party and give it a prominent position, I think the Shia have fought bravely, courageously, and I think the Sunni have fought bravely and courageously, and that the Russian intervention was the most strategically important part. We should not, we should not tamper with this situation, yes. Uh, any more questions? Uh, one, two, three, and that's it. One, two, three, and that's it. Oh, you also. No, him, okay. One, two, three, and that's it. Time up. Yeah, my question is, you said when uh, Jesus comes back, he will follow the Sharia of Muhammad, he will pray behind the Imam. You said he yes, pray. when he is with us, yeah. he prays in the way we pray. Yeah. When he is with his Ummah, he prays in accordance with that so law. he will be a prophet to his Ummah. Pardon me? So he will be a prophet to his Ummah. He has been a prophet. Yeah. He has been a prophet recognized by every Muslim for a long, 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 long time. And at the so, same time sorry. so he doesn't have to come back for me to recognize him as a prophet. But no. at the same time, he will be the Ummati of Muhammad, that's what you are saying. Who said that? You said he will pray behind the Imam, so he will be praying like Muslims toward the direction. The reason why, no, you were not listening to me. I gave you the explanation why. If my explanation is not adequate, then you don't have to accept my. Do I have to repeat my explanation? I told you why he did not lead the Salat. And I said to you, not because the Imam led the Salat, does that imply that the Imam is superior to him? No. No. The reason why he did not lead the prayer 
I can explain it to you. Yes. Uh, Are there any other scholars? Salam, <laughs> Sheikh. Are there? Salam, Who is? It? Yeah, go ahead. Are there any other scholars that have come to the conclusion that the jihad is as the Dajjal in Surah 30 and I am not aware. Um, of uh, anyone uh, before me who has ever interpreted the, the, the jasad to be the job. As a consequence of which I warn my readers and listeners, I warn them to be extra careful when critically assessing my views and I say to them please do not accept my interpretation unless you are convinced that it is correct. Is there anything more I can do? Can you suggest anything more I can do? No. Last question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. So we have oh, you're asking one question or three? Question. One, go ahead. So uh, we have seen in the Quran that Saudi uh, was the whole point was to guide the whole nation, right? And uh, Allah says in the Quran that we have sent you, and whoever follows my guidance is on the right spot. Uh, so you, 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 is this a Birmingham accent or a Manchester accent? Pakistani. A Pakistani <laughs> I'm not, come, come closer to me. I'm not understanding what you're saying. I have a Caribbean accent, Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> okay, uh, so my question is, uh, if you look at the history, uh, starting from Azza Adam, uh, the whole point was a lesson uh, appropriate to guide the nation. And as soon as the nation go uh, beyond their limits, uh, they read from the right path, a lesson, another prophet. And soon after that... Where, said, where did you get this from? So let's say... Um, no, no, you just said, yeah. when a nation deviates from the right path, yeah. then Allah sends another prophet. Where did you get this from? So let's say in, sort of, uh, not to, uh, in the story of Bani Israel, uh, they deviated and Allah said, I've sent you prophets after prophets and you used to kill them, not just one, maybe more than one. Yes, all day, yeah? so but that does not mean that there is a divine yeah. method that he sends a prophet only when a people deviate. We can't conclude. We can't okay. conclude. Yes, go ahead. So the sole purpose is to guide the nation, right? So the purpose of yeah. the prophet is to guide the people the and to set an example. an example. The people to whom he sent, yes. And we know that the law which a prophet had was uh, being replaced by a prophet who came afterwards. No. So that's what no, 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 that is not correct. So the, the, I, I did take some time to explain to you the verse of the Quran pertaining to change in law. Were you here? So what? No, were you here when I explained? Add, no, you were not there, okay. So can I add one, like let's say, uh, Allah says in the Quran that uh, I have perfected my religion for you today and that is Islam. So, when the religion is already been perfect and the whole point is that there should be one nation, one religion. No. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا If Allah had so desired, you know what I'm doing? I'm quoting the Quran. Yeah. This is the Quran. If Allah had so desired, He could have caused you all to be one ummah. He did not do it, but you want to do it? <laughs> okay, so then talk about Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. Uh, so his point was not to spread Islam, but rather, let's say if there is a Christian community, let them believe in Christianity or Islam as it. If, according to you, that would mean that. The Prophet has a duty to preach what is in the Quran exactly. to all of mankind. The Quran says that Allah did not ordain 
that all of mankind should be constituted as one ummah. He never said that. The Quran has said, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرَعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَ To each of you have we given a law and we have given a spiritual path. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا And if Allah had so desired, He could have caused you all to be one community, one ummah. وَلَكِنْ But Allah has not done that. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ Allah wants to test you in respect of that which is given to you, and to you, and to you, and to you. فَاسْتَبِقُ الْخَيْرَةِ So compete with each other in all that is good and virtuous. إِلَى اللَّهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ جَمِيعًا To Allah will you all return. You, and you, and you, this ummah, and this ummah, and that ummah. فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ and he will then explain to you those matters in which you differ. Which surah? Not you, do answer. Which surah of the Quran? You got homework to do, eh? <laughs> surah Tul Ma'idah of the Quran, yes? So this verse of the Quran and there are other verses conclusively demonstrate that Allah has ordained plurality amongst the communities while there is unity at the substance of truth in the deen or in the Allah in Islam. Okay? You have a lot of homework to do. <laughs> All right? But I'm happy, I'm happy to see you that you have an inquiring mind. That's a very good thing, yeah? Yeah. Another question, okay. I still don't get the purpose that at the end of the time, why would be there two communities, the Christianity Good. and Muslim, Good. two Qiblas, two the, prophets, yeah, the reason, everything is divided. The reason why you don't understand is because you're young. I, I, I was also young once, and I would go to my teacher, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, and I'd say to him, Maulana, I don't agree with you. I'm 22 years of age. Because he trained me like this. Maulana, I don't agree with you. And all that he would do is to smile. That's all. Four months later, I'll go to him and say, Maulana, now I agree with you. <laughs> Why? The Maulana wanted to train me to think to think and to climb the mountain of knowledge by myself. He said, I'll teach you how to climb, but I want you to climb by yourself. So he'll stand up in the classroom and he will say, I'm proud of Imran, because when I am dead and gone, he will not be like a parrot, just repeating mechanically what I have taught. So can you give some hints? to think about why there is differences between two communities. But he would think, and when he acquires and he accepts, it will be his knowledge. So when he then teaches, when I'm in my grave, he'll be teaching from his own knowledge. This is what my teacher used to say. So be patient, okay? And inshallah, may Allah bless you with knowledge. I think we've had enough for tonight. Uh, we have the books at the back. And you can bring the books to me for autographing, inshallah. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bring, bring it with. Okay, I don't have a pen.